Can I have the movie section, Papa? I want to see what's on tonight. I can tell you what's on tonight. Homework. Who needs it? You do. I saw your report card. You almost failed geometry, young lady. I think it's about time you learned a triangle is not necessarily a situation involving two men and a girl. Geometry's a big, fat drag. Even Kathy's not good at it. She's a brain's brain. Right, Kath? Kathy, what are you reading? The Francois du Par book. You mean that 16-year-old French girl? She may only be 16, but she's really lived. No wonder it's number one on the bestseller list. Good book? Marvelous, Uncle Martin. Pictures on the front of one of the magazines around here. Here it is. <laughs> Imagine that. Only 16 years old and she's the toast of Paris. It says here, she's a symbol of teenage freedom over there. All the kids are copying her hairstyles. They even named a street after her. <laughs> no wonder. She just sold her book to the movies for $200,000. It's wonderful. I hope they hurry and make the movie. What's the book about? About life, with a capital L, seen through the eyes of a teenage girl. Let me see that. My first dance was an unforgettable experience. Pierre was tall and shy and awkward. He had just learned to drive. It took all my powers of persuasion to get Father to allow Pierre to drive me to the dance. We got into the car and drove off. We had gone only a block when Pierre ran into a car that was turning the corner. In the other car was Father. Hey, that happened to you when Richard first got his car. Yeah, I know. I still have the bruises. This stuff is a bestseller? I can write stuff like this. You can write stuff like what? Like this Francoise Dupar. And there's no competition. There are no teenagers writing novels today. Oh, well, that may be That's true, why but... Francoise Dupar's book became a bestseller. Because she's a teenager. Patty, the critics don't care how old you are. It's what you have to say. I have a lot to say. What would you write about? Me. <laughs> Life with a capital L. I've even got the title. I was a teenage teenager. I mean, writing requires a great deal of discipline. I mean, it would mean giving up dates, movies. I need a place to work where I can be completely undisturbed. I know. I'll work in the garret. The garret? I think she means the attic. <laughs> Same thing. Oh, I don't think you can work up there, dear. It's dirty and dusty and a mess. Gee, that sounds like your room. <laughs> sounds perfect. After all, create, you must suffer. <laughs> That's what? Move over. <laughs> Live most everywhere, from Zanzibar to Barclay Square. But Patty's only seen the sights a girl can see from Brooklyn Heights. What a crazy pair! But they're cousins, identical cousins all the way. One pair of matching bookends, different as night and day. Where Kathy adores a minuet, the ballet russe. And Crepe Suzette. Our Patty loves to rock and roll. A hot dog makes her lose control. What a wild duet. Still their cousins. Identical cousins and you find. They laugh alike. They walk alike. At times they even talk alike. You can lose your mind. When cousins. to work up here, Patty. It's going to be awfully uncomfortable. William Shakespeare never complained. Alfred and I are going to the movies tonight. Wouldn't you like to join us? Sorry, Kath. When the creative juices flow, you gotta let them go. <laughs> You're sure you'll be all right up here? Louisa May Alcott never complained. <laughs> Everything I want is right here. If there's anything I can do to help, Patty. Nothing, thank you. Creation is the bird of loneliness. <laughs> Good luck. It has nothing to do with luck. It's 
pure talent. <laughs> I was a teenage teenager. <laughs> By Patty Lane. A teenager. <laughs> One morning, I... Early one afternoon, I... One night. <laughs> Hello, darling. Hi, Mom. How was school? Fine. Did a package come for me? Yes. of you while I was driving here. Did you, Bernardo? What made you think of me? On the road was a sign that said, soft shoulders. <laughs> oh, oh, Bernardo, you have the drollest sense of humor. <laughs> Where's Patty? Up in the attic, working on her book. Do you know I've been waiting an hour for her at the bowling alley? That's the third date she's broken in a row. Oh, she probably forgot about it. That's a fine excuse. Well, she's gonna have to choose. It's either her career or me. Did you say she was up in the attic? I don't think she wants to be disturbed. Well, she's gonna be. Another reason the road reminded me of you, Jenny. You have dangerous curves. <laughs> Jenny gives a peal of laughter. What are you laughing at? <laughs> Bernardo just said something funny. Well, where is he? <laughs> He's in my book. He has the most marvelous sense of humor. Why are you gonna finish that, Patty? I've been out bowling by myself, and you've been up here laughing by yourself. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. It will make sense when my book is finished. I'm going to do for the American teenager what Francoise did for the French teenager. Well, what did she do for them? She liberated them. <laughs> she made the world look at them in a new light. Well, how long is this liberation going to take? Well, about us. You don't write a bestseller overnight. It might take me another week. Here's your dinner, Patty. What's the matter? Didn't Louisa May Alcott eat? What happened? I just murdered Reginald. <laughs> hey, Patty, it's 12 o'clock. I just have to finish this chapter. Did you write all that? That's the prologue. <laughs> you gotta call it, Gone with the Wind? I thought I'd let the publisher choose the title. The... <clears throat> Honey, you know, it isn't all that easy to get something published. I guess if it were, everybody would write a book. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that I really wouldn't count too much on this, if I were you. Papa, will you be home this Saturday? 
Yeah, but I think so. Why? I'm going to be through with the book by then. Would you read it? <sighs> sure, sure. I'd love to. Thanks. Well, uh, all right. You, you finish up and get to bed, huh? Good night, dear. Good night, Papa. Did you hear that? Did I hear what? Stampede. Stampede. It started, Bernardo. <laughs> You know that I love you very much, don't you? You hated it. No, I didn't hate it. There's some good things in it. I just... You want my honest criticism? Of course. Well, honey, the first rule of good writing is to choose a subject you know something about. You mean, it didn't seem authentic to you? Why? For one thing, you've never been a teenage nurse among the Pui Pui Indians in the wilds of the Mato Grosso. Edgar Rice Burroughs wasn't brought by a gorilla in Africa. You create with your imagination. Besides, I researched it. Yeah, well, that's not the same. Didn't you like the war scenes? Yes, I did. They were real and vivid and authentic. Do you mean that? I certainly do. I felt the same way about them the first time I read them 20 years ago. They made Hemingway famous. Oh, it may have a Hemingway flavor, but I... Yeah, I know. You were just researching. Well, what about the character of Jenny? She didn't come from Hemingway. No, I felt she was more like Joan of Arc, only braver. You hated everything. No, I didn't. Now, there were some really fine things in there. The things that were all your own, you know? In fact, for instance, the comedy scene was just wonderful. The comedy scene? During the big battle. Remember when the enemies were locked in, uh, what was your phrase? In the throes of mortal and deadly anguish with their eyes caught in, in fierce combat. <laughs> and then Jenny comes by with her first aid kit. And they take one look at her and stop fighting and start trying to date her. <laughs> that wasn't a comedy scene. I see. Oh, no, Patty, please. I was... I'm sorry for taking up your valuable time. What happened? Oh, it was a disaster. Was the book that bad? It was a combination of Hemingway, Salinger, and Superman, only ungrammatical. It's easy for everybody to sit back and criticize. But I'll tell you this. There's going to be a lot of crow eating around here when my book gets published. Publishers. Repeat. Publishers. Publishers. Here we are. You're not going to send it to a publisher. What did you think I was going to do with it? Well, a lot of authors just put their first book away. They consider it a, a kind of training. They don't put bestsellers away. <laughs> it has everything. Love, war, poverty, death, cooking recipes. <laughs> I mean, you never read a book before where they actually gave you a cooking recipe right in the middle of a chapter, did you? No? Do you know what the bestsellers are? Cookbooks. And I've thrown it in for nothing. Six of Mom's best recipes. <laughs> Just wait. I'll show all of you. Uh, Patty, how was everything at school today? Fine, thank you. Are you feeling all right? Fine, thank you. <laughs> now look, Patty, I know how sensitive the artistic temperament is. But you've had this iron curtain up for a week now. I, I told you I'm sorry if I've hurt your feelings. But if you're going to be an author, then you have to get used to criticism. Besides, I wasn't criticizing you. I was criticizing your book. Of course. I understand. Actually, 
Okay. telegram from my publisher. <laughs> my book's going to be published immediately. They expect it to be a bestseller. <laughs> if you'll forgive me now, I think I'll retire to my garret. <laughs> How did you get the idea for your book? Well, everyone is always attacking the teenager. When adults think of us, they think of rock and roll, telephones, hamburgers. I wanted to give them a more realistic image. Show them the real us. Yeah, a brave teenage girl runs away from her home in Detroit to become a nurse among the poi poi Indians in the wilds of the Mount Gross. <laughs> oh, hello, Mr. Lane. Hello, boys. Hello, Patty. Hi, Papa. Alfred's interviewing Patty for the Brooklyn Heights Clarion. The paper's running a front page story on her. Yeah, it's wonderful. You know, teenage girl becomes famous author overnight. I'll bet it must make you feel kind of funny. Me scooping your daughter like this. I mean, you being a newspaper editor, too. <clears throat> well, yeah, it does feel a little funny, yeah. I suppose you're planning a Sunday feature story on her, huh? Well, we, uh, we hadn't decided on the day yet. <laughs> Our readers would like to know your opinions about your fellow authors. Uh, whom do you admire most? Ernest Hemingway. What do you think of T.S. Eliot? T.S. is long-winded, but very talented. And Francoise Dupas? An illiterate French child. Well, uh, if you'll excuse me. Would you be going to Hollywood to write the picture? Probably. Hello, dear. Hey, what's cooking? It smells good. That's me. Oh. <laughs> Is the press conference still going on? Oh, yeah. I can't understand it. The book is being published. Yeah, I know it is, but I don't know why. Couldn't you have been wrong about it? It's not very good. Well, the publisher saw values in it that you didn't see. You read it. What's your opinion? It's not very good. And yet somebody is willing to shell out an advance of one or two thousand dollars, plus the money it's going to take to publish it. According to the telegram, the contracts are on the way. So I guess we must be wrong. What are we having for dinner tonight? Crow. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Blair of the Fire Publishing Company. I wanted to meet Miss Patricia Lane. Oh, well, how do you do, Mr. Blair? I'm Patricia's father. Well, it's an honor, sir, an honor and a privilege. I always say more attention should be paid to the parents of talented writers. Behind every talented writer is a mother, a father, shaping them, molding them. Genius, I always say, is no accident. Uh, no. Well, I'm sorry, but pa <coughs> Patricia is out right now. Oh, well, my fault, sir. I should have telephoned first, but I just happened to be in the neighborhood, and I did want to meet Patricia and to drop the contracts off. Well, you brought the contracts with you? Oh, yes. All she has to do is sign them. Come in, won't you? Yeah. Well, this is my niece, Kathy. This is Mr. Blair, Patricia's publisher. How do you do? Patty will be so sorry she missed you. Oh, that's all right. She'll be seeing a lot of me. That's a mighty talented young woman. We don't get many manuscripts like hers. I should think not. <laughs> well, I don't want to detain you, Mr. Lane. I would like to discuss the advance. Well, we can talk about that if you like. Uh, what did you have in mind? Well, our usual advance is $1,500. $1,500? $1, $1,500? Well, yes, if that is satisfactory to her. Well, I'm sure that it would be. That's more than satisfactory. Mr. Blair, do you really feel Patty's book is going to be a bestseller? There's no doubt about it. That book has got everything. 
to romance, war, death, cooking recipes. <laughs> well, I've got other authors to see tonight, and I'm sure you have business to take care of, Mr. Lane, so if you'll just give me the check, I'll be on my way. Check? The $1,500. You want a $1,500 advance from me? No, from your daughter. <laughs> oh, from, from my daughter. Uh, this uh, publishing firm of yours, Mr. Blair, it's one of those vanity presses, I take it. Well, I um, wouldn't call it that. I don't care what you call it. The point is that people pay you money to publish their books so they can see their name in print. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, Mr. Lane. And you'll publish anything that's submitted to you. Well, actually, Mr. Lane, my business is not with you. It's with your daughter. And she did sign a contract. Had he signed a contract? Oh, yes. All of our authors, when they submit their manuscripts to us, sign a contract specifying that if we accept their book for publication, they will be personally responsible for all the cost of the publication thereof. And the contract is airtight. So if you want to talk to anybody, you can talk to my lawyer. Good night, Mr. Lane. Young lady. Miss Blair. Be sure to tell your lawyer that the girl who signed the contract is 16 years old. What did you say? <laughs> I said that you'd made an airtight contract with a minor. You mean a 16-year-old girl wrote that book? Well, Hemingway, Solinger, and Betty Crocker wrote some of it. I ought to sue you for wasting my time. Good night. You're forgetting something, Mr. Blair. What? You promised my daughter that you'd publish her book. Forget it. All right, I won't detain you, Mr. Blair. We're both busy men. You have authors to see, and I have to get down to my newspaper. <laughs> you think... You wouldn't be, uh, Martin Lane, would you? Yes. Not the managing editor of the New York Chronicle? Yes. Mr. Lane, the uh, Vanity Press is a uh, perfectly legitimate branch of the publishing business. We cater to people's dreams, people whose dream it is to see their novel in print. I'm aware of that. Yes, well, now I would not want to be unfair about this. Um, your daughter's book does have a, a certain naive uh, charm to it. <laughs> I don't see any reason why we uh, shouldn't publish it. At our expense, of course. I suggest a um, ten-copy press run. Uh, that way, uh, Patricia will be satisfied and she'll never have to know uh, how big the edition was. Patty has a lot of friends. <laughs> well, all right, uh, 25 copies. <laughs> 50 copies. Uh, 100 copies. <laughs> That's a nice round figure. Boy, Kathy, were you smart not to go? That movie wasn't released. It escaped. <laughs> Patty, I want you to meet your publisher. This is Mr. Blair. Mr. Blair? Yeah, I can't tell you how excited I am. I I've never been published before. <laughs> how did you like the book? I sincerely feel that that book is one of the most unusual works we have ever handled. Francoise Dupont, je suis arrivé. <laughs> Celebrity is sure rough on the finger. I also autographed a hundred books. You promised you'd autograph one for me. Okay, okay. Could you put on it to Ross from his sister who wrote the book? Sure. Thanks. I promised the kids that I'd bring it to class tomorrow. Your book has certainly created a stir around Brooklyn Heights High. I'll bet it has. Created quite a stir around here. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Well, I brought the revised contracts. That's wonderful, Mr. Blair. Uh, you don't mind if I read those first, do you? Help so. Thank you. Boy, have I got a surprise for you, Mr. Blair. My new book. <laughs> Kathy, who 
has lived most everywhere, from Zanzibar to Barclay Square. But Patty's only seen the sights a girl can see from Brooklyn Heights. What a crazy pair. Walk alike at times, they even talk alike. You can lose your mind when cousins are two of a 